welcome to KMET 1490 AM ABC News Radio and the Southern California Business Report with Yvette Walker, a show dedicated to highlighting successful Southern California businesses and the people behind them. Welcome and thank you for joining Southern California Business Report on ABC News and Talks, KMET 1490 AM, 98.1 FM and KMET TV. I'm Yvette Walker, live, blasting our signal from the center of Southern California, serving a population of over 25 million. Get us crystal clear and on demand by downloading the free live streaming app on Google Play and the Apple App Store. As always, a huge shout out to the team, Mitch, Bill, and Sean, I love you guys, and to our special advisory committee that can be found at www.scbrtalk.com backslash advisory committee. Click on the link, check them out, and discover the people that are doing the work. Okay, everyone, today I have the distinct honor to introduce Dr. Eileen Dingjian, who serves as the Executive Director of Population Health at, that, at the San Antonio Regional Hospital Randall Lewis Healthy Communities Institute. Eileen leads the development of population health management initiatives and provides leadership and oversight for the Healthy Communities Institute and community outreach programs. Eileen serves to address the healthcare worker shortage and elements of the educational achievement gaps through HCI programming by creating workforce pipelines with students as early as middle and high school students. Thank you so much for being with us today, Dr. Ding Jun. Happy to be here. <laughs> Beautiful. So as you know, my first question to all of my guests is to please talk about what inspired you to pursue your path in your career, in this case, in healthcare. So, uh, I'm from the Inland Empire, so I grew up in Chino, and the Healthy Communities Movement has been around as early as I can remember when I uh, was coordinating the Healthy Chino program in 2005, around that time, and I was in college, uh, graduating college at that time as well. So my initial spark of interest was really serving the community, and my undergrad was in political science, so I thought that was the route I would go to, but I realized that there was a lot more that we needed to address. At that time, it was childhood obesity um, and, you know, children dying before their parents. And it's still a significant problem with diabetes. And uh, it, it sparked my interest then I, to pursue and formalize my education in public health and learn a little bit more about how can I actually make an impact in our community. So um, I was very local. I was at Cal Poly Pomona, but I did get my master's in Washington, D.C., which I got a little bit more exposure on some of these healthcare initiatives and rounded that out, and I'm actually really happy to be back in the region at San Antonio Regional Hospital to continue this effort that's been going on for almost 20 years plus, um, I, probably beyond my time as well in public health. So I just see the people in our community doing so many good work, especially Randall Lewis, who's been very prominent in our community. And I am very blessed and grateful that we have leaders, leadership like him, who has supported the San Lewis San Antonio Healthy Communities Institute, so we can continue these efforts in the schools and beyond. Perfect. So uh, the first time that I had you on, this is the third time you're joining, but the first time you were on, you were just starting in your role at the Lewis San Antonio Healthy Communities Institute. So I'm really excited to hear about the growth and what is on your radar today. Um, let's jump in by talking about your clinical shadowing and how innovative that is and how that is different from other shadowing programs. Yeah, so that was a very, very, very good idea that was initiated by our CEO and president of the hospital, John Chapman, who went through this when he was in high school, and it was brought to the attention at Upland Unified initially to uh, pipeline some of the students or um, recruit students from the healthcare pathway program at Upland in high school. And so we did pilot the program last summer with nine students, with the exception of one from Los Osos who found her way <laughs> into the program, which is great. And it's demonstrated the need and address in addressing the shortage of our healthcare workforce. And the goal really is that you, you can see our CEO has been very, um, uh, very strongly supportive of this program, especially in the schools and also in general with our, our, uh, um, the Lewis San Antonio Healthy Communities Institute, where we want students to be exposed into allied healthcare careers. So, in building on some of our programming, which is, for example, young healthcare professionals, we were in, we're in the classroom teaching some of these allied careers. But this was a new venture where they're in the hospital. They get to see a lot of different new different things that they're not 
initially exposed to in the community. Um, nothing that we can really provide into the classroom unless um, they have a simulation lab that's available to them, but they are going into uh, different units from telemetry, pharmacy, um, lab, and surgery. And uh, I can tell you the testimonials from the students, what they received and learn, they're ready for med school next year. <laughs> that's the way I see it. So I am just very grateful that they have this opportunity that we didn't have when we were growing up in high school, because it really shows that there are students that are either they are very interested in the field, might be looking to hone in on their skills and experiences. And then there are those that have no idea what this field looks like. It may not be for them as well. So that patient, uh, they won't be engaging with patients. They really get to just observe um, the, the setting, the environment, and watch the practitioners uh, react to some of the needs of our patients coming in. So we're very excited this, uh, this year we're going to, to be, we partnered with the San Bernardino, San Bernardino County Superintendent of Schools who are helping us expand. And the goal is really to reach out to other partner hospitals in the community to initiate and launch a similar clinical shadowing program. So that way we, we can can't, we can't place all the students at San Antonio, unfortunately, and we're seeing a lot of demands now from students in, in the, throughout the school districts who are looking for opportunities like these. And we're hoping that the hospitals um, will place the students that are closer to the region from the high desert, San Bernardino County, um, and other areas locally as well. So, um, but yeah, it's very unique right now. I feel that we do stand as a model for what we're able to provide for the next cohort, which this spring, uh, during their spring break, we have Chafee Joint Union High School District who will be at San Antonio. We have about 19 students who will be participating in, in in I think eleven different units in our throughout our our department, so it's like PT, uh, radiology, uh, same you know telemetry, surgery, ER. There's all kinds of placements where they're going to be really exposed to a more expanded version within our hospital. Right, and so um, you know you hit the head on the nail, um, the nail on the head, I should say, when you <laughs> talk about um, exposing these students uh, to the healthcare field. And, you know, giving them the opportunity to decide if this is for them or, you know, maybe it's not for them, right? So um, an early um, uh, segue into whether or not this career field is for them as they enter their college years. Um, I absolutely love it. And I love that it's grown from its beginning. Uh, the first uh, interview with you, I believe, was almost three years ago. Um, you were coming in new and now it's expanding, it's scaling. And please share with us how exactly the San Bernardino County Superintendent of Schools is supporting and uh, growing your platform. Yeah, so which is really nice. We we sent out our Lewis San Antonio Healthy Communities Impact Report and it caught the attention of the county where uh, we've been invited to submit a proposal for funding that will help with some of our programming really into the schools because that's what we really, that's what we do. We are uh, interacting with the teachers, with the administrators and students. And so with our impact report that demonstrated the different ways of how we engage with students from wellness to workforce development and mental health. And so uh, because the, the the county was really interested in seeing what they can do to continue to support workforce development um, in a in more expanded way, we submitted a proposal with our Young Healthcare Professionals Academy program and also the clinical shadowing program and so they have been uh, they have been very receptive to what we were proposing and funded our program about one hundred fifty thousand dollars to expand this work and the goal is really we're gonna the goal we're very ambitious we're going to reach three hundred additional students throughout the region with our young healthcare academy program and you know more expanded. Uh, placements for our students in clinical shadowing as well with partner hospitals. And, and we're working towards some of the, the county hospital, well, Arrowhead Regional Hospital and St. Bernardine's is very promising as well. And, uh, um, and those are the two hospitals right now that we're engaged with that have made um, some progress and making hopefully the commitment to support students. And that's the goal. And so, yeah, we're really excited to see how this program has been flourishing over time. And I have to really thank my team, Indira and Janet, who's been on the floor, on the on the ground, really being with the students uh, more recently. They're actually here there today at 
Lehigh Elementary School <laughs> doing super science days with the kids because they're not coming into the hospital, but we're showing them ways to also get excited about science and health as well. Beautiful. So tell us more about the Young Healthcare Academy and how those expanded models look. Is that something you're going to be managing from the Lewis San Antonio uh, Healthy Communities Institute, or is that something that's going to be under the purview of each individual hospital? Yeah, so we are looking at clinical shadowing because not every student can be placed into the hospital. Anyone that has applied or has an interest in healthcare, we are hoping to to also provide this available in the community, whether it's after school or at a local community center or library where we can facilitate um, kind of a role play of career opportunities in healthcare. So what does a phlebotomist look like or a clinical lab scientist? These are very much needed career fields in, in healthcare. And so, um, and the goal is also to provide them with basic life support training, um, CPR kits that are offered to students to get them certified, including a food handler. So when they graduate from um, high school, these are high school students, they would be able to have something tangible to really, you know, put under their belt as they pursue careers. Because the goal is that we want them to feel empowered to pursue a career in healthcare, especially especially anywhere in food safety as well. That's really important. Um, when, you, when you think about basic soft skills or basic life skills, customer service, whether they go into retail or um, healthcare, they are all translational or transformative <laughs> skills, um, transformational skills that they can develop and, um, and hone in as they continue with their careers. Absolutely. And so um, I just want to bring uh, to the attention um, the fact that you were on the ground uh, during a, a recent um, tragedy that occurred uh, with a couple of uh, Los Oso students, a brother and a sister. Please uh, talk to us about that and how you and the Luis San Antonio Health Healthy Communities Institute was able to be on the ground and offer support. Yeah, you know, that was very tragic. We learned about that news, which is very close to Chafee College in Rancho de Cucamonga and the two Los Osos students that lost their lives, um, Sarah and Elias. Um, my heart went out to the family immediately. I just can't imagine the children, you know, the parents, what they're going through losing their child. And so uh, by chance, you know, we were scheduled to be at Los Osos for their mental health fair. And so we got an email asking us to continue to participate in the event given that the district was undergoing several other losses, you know, some of the teachers have also lost their lives over the past weekend and another student also lost their life. I think, um, uh, I think it's Rancho Cucamonga high school. And, uh, you know, these tragedies, we, we really mourn on that loss. It's a big community loss for young lives that have very promising bright features. And um, knowing that the students when they came up to the table from what I've learned from my staff who was on the, on the ground on again, Indira and Janet, um, they can see when they ask, are you okay? They'll say yes, but their face says something else, right? Their body language tells them something else. So the fact that we're able to um, pivot and adjust our typical usual outreach with mental health and support the, the Los Osos community while we're there at the schools was um, was very much needed. And we know that it, there are folks that are hurting. These were kids with um, that were teammates on a softball team, a baseball team, their friends or classmates. Um, I can't imagine the devastation of the person who survived that accident. There was a third person. And uh, it, it, it hit us all. I feel our community has been hit hard with something very tragic. And again, we really we acknowledge some of the um, suicide ideation that students go through in our community, and we want to be able to provide all these resources that we have at our disposal, whether it's, you know, asking them, what do you do for self-care or what made you smile today? Simple as that. Kind of give them something to think about if they didn't even think about what got them up to smile, you know, during that day. Because sometimes some they may not be asked those kinds of questions. And so I'm, I'm really proud of our team who have been, been, you know, accepting of all the different challenges that we go through because we're very small and mighty, but we try to get out into the different high school, different communities and address some of these very real incidents. And that one for sure had hit us hard, you know, on a Friday night a week ago. 
Right. And so um, with opportunities that come up like that, do you view this as a segue to the possibility of going into more behavioral health, mental health efforts under the Lewis San Antonio Healthy Communities Institute? Yeah, so that's a very big initiative, and I think it really expands beyond the walls of what we are able to to pursue. And um, behavioral health is such a big issue around our community. We, we're trying to address it in all different angles at San Antonio Regional Hospital, especially those that are coming in through our ED, right? We call them either, you know, frequent flyers or um, high utilizers, and we are seeing the different um, diagnoses that they come in for in some of these areas. And the under the way we approach and the way my team in population health approach this is through understanding the community needs, whether it's basic um, basic needs, food, safety, a roof over their heads, being able to pay that bill. Um, those that are unhoused or experiencing homelessness, right? It doesn't have to be the person on the street, but they are feeling like, you know, I got to live in the living room of my aunt or I got to take in another family member in my house. Uh, and those are real. And we know that we want to be able to address um, those kinds of losses, especially I also think about the post-pandemic era, right? There's We can see the effects, especially in the students you know, who are now, I think, are graduating seniors who since the pandemic, Pandemic. Oh my gosh, it's been like almost how long? Four years ago, yes. right? And and thinking about that and how how we, we redirect our programming is really key. And so um, I, I do think being able to gamify, our, you know, what we do in the classroom is one of the areas that our team has been looking into. That kind of helps with uh, just general learning uh, in the high school setting. But behavioral health is such a big issue to tackle in general because we have to think about those that are exposed to substance use and how do we deal with um, family members that might be going through some kind of addiction and where do they go so the question really is the discharge portion if they come and get hospitalized at our hospital how do we support them in that effort thereafter Right. So going back um, again to the students, um, please talk about your efforts to raise awareness and training on the use of Narcan on the campus or, you know, around young people. Yeah. So Narcan is distributed. We are we give it out at the hospital and we also have it on hand when we do outreach. So our our team, actually our population health team, Megan and Emma, are, are out constantly giving away Narcan. No questions asked. They, they can always report it back if they've ever had to use it. Um, but essentially, they are um, given the instructions to how to use Narcan when they're distributed. And um, a lot of what we've realized that a lot of parents do take one, two, three, not that they hopefully need to use it. But you, there's just those instances where you just never know you might run into someone that have the need to um to use Narcan to reverse these effects of whether it's fentanyl or some other substance use. So um, I think just raising awareness that this is real, we can actually reverse this kind of effect in the community is available. We don't have to, um, we can save lives through that end as well. I think we've seen a lot of tragedies. Um, One is already enough in our community and we've seen someone that's overdosed with fentanyl. Absolutely. And, you know, speaking of San Bernardino County Superintendent of Schools, I had the honor of serving as a panelist for uh, the students' initiatives that are addressing those community needs assessments and coming up with solutions. And during the presentation, um, to them, Narcan was a big deal. They wanted to see it on their campus, available, maybe even in the bathrooms, right, um, dispensable, and um, uh, to have the access without the stigma of requesting it. So how is it that you go about uh, that training in terms of accessing it by students and, you know, eliminating that stigma and understanding that, you know what, like you said, you never know when you can need it. You could be out on the street. It may not be for yourself or a friend, but someone um, unknown um, that can be in need. Yeah, I think it's just very simple. We will let them know it's available. We don't ask questions. We don't ask for insurance. We don't ask for any information. Students can actually, the school district does do provide these. They have them available at their nursing offices as well. But um, And so we leave it at the school's discretion to uh, distribute it as they see necessary. Um, but for us, whenever we interact with families in the community, we have them on hand available and they just take it, you know, and if they have questions, we will help answer those questions for them. Right. And so earlier you talked about CPR training. Is that something you offer 
to all of the students when you go visit the schools? How does that program work? Yeah, so I wish we could offer it to all the students, but with our Young Healthcare Academy, Young Healthcare Professionals Academy program, it is embedded in our curriculum where the goal is that they develop these basic life skills. And part of it is really understanding what does it mean to um, activate these areas that they may not be um, considering when you think about healthcare or think about saving lives or thinking about um, developing these communication skills. Right. You have to learn how to communicate when someone is in a crisis mode or in a need or these techniques. Right. That can be um, empowering for the students. So we we only have a limited amount of um, kits that we have available to offer to the students. And so we are hoping to expand that as well, um, given that we. We want to grow and expand our bandwidth to reach out to more students. And part of it is also, you know, when we think about developing young students in, in this area, it's, it's, we're in the classroom several times a week, uh, sometimes several times a week, multiple, multiple weeks over a course of a month. And really it's just to spark that interest of what you know, this simple um, activity or exercise can spark an interest in the field of healthcare as well. So um, would you mind giving us a very brief refresher course, you know, the ABCs of CPR for all of our listeners today, because, um, you know, sometimes we think we know how to do it properly. And, you know, <laughs> when the moment comes, it's like, oh, my God, you forget everything, you freeze, and you're yeah. scrambling to remember, how do I do this? So please give us a brief refresher course. My favorite thing I tell people is think of the song. If you know the song, staying alive, right? <laughs> so yes. when you're pumping 30 pumps, you know, to the chest. So the first thing you need to do when you see someone that's not unconscious, you want to tap on them, see if they're breathing. You know, you, you kind of have to yell at them like, are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? If they're not responding. You check for the pulse, right? It's really important to check for the pulse. If there's no pulse, that's when you start looking for help. You know, you want to make sure someone is calling 911. You point to the person like, I need you to go find me some help. Call 911. You start giving that instruction. So that way you can start your CPR, which is 30 compressions in the chest and then uh, two breaths, right? So staying alive, stay alive. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> yeah, stay alive. Yeah, together so now. <laughs> 30 times, two breaths until um, you have your ambulance or EMT that comes to take over. And hopefully that person is resuscitated and uh, revived from a very tragic incident. So that's the basic short term, short version of of CPR, but it does take a, a pretty long time to get certified because there are uh, different steps to learn uh, from CPR. If you do take CPR, sometimes there's a course on AED, how to use defibrillators as well to shock the heart or shock yeah, them back into um, heart rhythm if their they're pulse is not, um, if there's no pulse. So there, those are very critical, but for students, I think hands-on CPR, CPR training is one of the most empowering thing you can give a student, quite honestly because it could be a, a parent or a loved one or a friend who might uh, be unconscious and they can help save a life as well. Absolutely. I, I love the work and it would be so exciting to see that, you know, the students expression as they're learning something so critical and valuable and seeing that empowerment, right? Because as they say, knowledge is power, but to have the power to save a life, What's what's better than that, right? Yeah, yeah. I think that's a, that's a if there's one thing you're going to walk away with, it's like, I know how to save someone's life. Exactly. So with that said, we're going to hit a break. So everybody listening right now, Yvette Walker here with ABC News and Talk, Southern California Business Report here today with Dr. Eileen Dinkjian discussing her work serving as a groundbreaking model for population health at San Antonio Regional Hospital with programs aimed at closing the gap to healthcare access, communication, programs and workforce development to enhance, streamline to anticipate needs and healthcare delivery to our region when we return. Hi, I'm Dana Rademacher with MGR Property Management. 
A lot of people wonder about the value that property management has for their property. Property management can include all property types, including residential, commercial, and HOA. It is valuable because property managers are experienced in what can happen at your property. We're aware of liabilities. We're able to do predictive and preventative maintenance. We know what is coming up with the changes in the weather, the seasons, how old certain aspects or different capital projects at your property are. We're able to best negotiate contract pricing, legalities with your tenants, and anything else that you may need to ensure that you're getting the full value of the property. If you're interested in speaking with the representative at MGR Property Management regarding your property management needs, you can visit our website at mgrrealestate.com or you can call our number at area code 909-581-6600 to be connected with the representative. The University of Laverne is rated first in California for alumni satisfaction. Learn more about accelerated programs offered online and on campus in Laverne, Irvine, Ontario, Burbank, or College of the Canyons. Visit go.laverne.edu. The University of Laverne. Go.laverne.edu. Cal State San Bernardino is home to the only school of entrepreneurship in California. With globally ranked degree programs, you can start your journey today to become a successful entrepreneur. Learn more and connect at entre.csusb.edu. Ontario International Airport is on to a better way to fly with over 65 daily non-stop flights to more than 20 major destinations and the easiest airport experience in Southern California. Visit flyonto.com slash Ontario to learn more about Ontario International Airport today. Hi, I'm San Bernardino County Sheriff Shannon Dykus. If you're looking to start an exciting career in law enforcement and make a difference in your community, we are hiring. Dispatchers, nurses, deputies, laterals, and many more. For a complete list of our jobs and more information, visit sheriffsjobs.com. We are the Empire Strikers, the professional sports team of the Inland Empire. We are a fast-actioned and community-inspired pro-indoor soccer team. Our mission is to inspire the Empire. Home games, community events, watch parties, and youth camps are all back. Professional indoor soccer is back. Join us and come watch the greatest show on turf at Toyota Arena or on Twitch. Visit www.TheEmpireStrikers.com for more and any information. Welcome back, everyone. Yvette Walker with ABC News and Talk Southern California Business Report here today with Dr. Eileen Dingchian discussing her work serving as a groundbreaking model for population health at San Antonio Regional Hospital with programs aimed at closing the gap to healthcare access, communication, program workforce development to enhance streamline to anticipate the needs and healthcare delivery to our region. Thank you so much for being with us again, Dr. Dingchian. My pleasure to be here. Beautiful. So prior to the break, um, we spoke about the clinical shadowing program, um, some of the ways that you reach out to the community and offer support and training, uh, CPR, a very critical one. Um, and now let's go into uh, the parent family leadership programs, which sounds brilliant, right? Because uh, in addition to training the students, you now have opportunities for parents to engage and really make a much larger impact. Yeah, and so this is the partnership we have with Ontario Montclair uh, School District, and they have a par parent family engagement uh, center, which is really amazing because I think about other school districts that don't have those available, where the parents are looking for things to be involved in and to support, you know, even enhance their own skills to uh, contribute to society. I think that's one of the greatest things about the center is that they have these resources available to parents and keeping them engaged in our community as well. And so the nice thing about our team is that we're able to offer some of the trainings that we already do in the community and bring it to the parents. And, and so we're very excited. Some of them also include, you know, like what are the eight dimensions of wellness, right? We need to know how do we even take care of ourselves? Because as parents, we know that it takes a lot when you have someone that's driving maybe an hour away and coming 
getting back home very late and can only do a pickup to feed the family for dinner. And so, um, but how do we navigate through those challenges when there's, you know, the life of a, of a parent could be, there's, especially if you have multiple children, could be, you know, like we want them to be also involved in extra extracurricular activities um there's homework there's all these pressures that surround the school system and so we want them uh to be equipped with some of the resources we have available um part of a lot of it is really on our surrounding around wellness for the parents and that they take care of themselves so that they can take care of their students right and so we hear this term a lot health equity please talk about what that means and how it is that you address it in your um, Lewis San Antonio Healthy Communities Institute programming. Yeah, I mean, we think about the pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic, and what really highlighted some of the health disparities, which is really showing that uh, there's a there's a there's a disparity, right, between communities, especially in a Hispanic Latino community that are not um, coming and seeking primary care and why and the question could be um are they are, are they informed of, of the need to get screened and the importance of getting their um making their appointments so that way they take care of their preventative care right and so there's a lot of um things that we're learning about um even in our you know um our our infants our black infants right there's disparities with mothers that are um, in the community that need additional support. And so we think about health equity. We think about are they gaining the access that they need to um, seek the care that they need to see, right? And so are they available in their communities? And if not, how can we make sure that they get those? resources to them. And, and it's really important for us because at San Antonio, we see a lot of high um, ED utilizers, primarily those that are homeless or unhoused. And there's been a growing number of homeless individuals in our, our community. So in 2017, we've had about, um, I think like around 1,700, and it's grown over time. Now we have 4,000, right, in our in our county with that are that are homeless. And so what are we doing to surround ourselves with those that or support our, support the community? And one of those areas in addressing health equity in our space is understanding, you know, um, our partnerships with the Inland Empire Health Plan and enhancing those care. So there's a whole new movement coming down from the state, uh, Cal AIM, called Enhanced Care Management. And so that's really supporting those that have the most complex chronic illnesses that needs to be addressed. And we can't ignore that. That's something that has to be um, managed, one, through the managed care plan, such as IEHP, but we could be a provider to support that effort in um, giving them the the the, uh, the care that they need, the treatments that they need. So uh, I'm sure John has talked a lot about this before, but we are building out a re recuperative care where we would be able to house, you know, those that are in treatment and, and make sure that they receive everything that they need before to get discharged. So it's a lot of effort on our part. I feel like it's that the investment needs to be there from the hospital. And it looks like we are making strides on that end to um, bridge those health inequities in our community. And so that's very important to us. And we drive a lot of this effort also just educating community. What are the legal um, laws that are coming down right now that will make an impact on making sure that we are providing the appropriate resources, right, for those in our community. Right. And that data comes from community health needs assessments, right? Please go briefly into that. Yeah. So we are, every three years, we have to conduct a community health needs assessment. And so in the past, we've seen a lot of need to address the uh, population with um, with cancer needs. And oncology is still a very important part of the work that we do, but we've seen a change in that and prioritizing a little bit more around mental health, cardiovascular health health. Uh, we're seeing hypertension primarily in Ontario and, um, and heart failure. AFib is also a very prominent area that we're seeing in the hospital and also um, maternal infant child health. So those are the three primary service area or primary areas that we are uh, addressing in our community health needs assessment. But the way we address that is through what we call a vital conditions framework. And so to have this, what we call civic muscle, right, we need to make sure that these families are really equipped with what they need to be able to take care of themselves. So if they are having trouble keeping a job or have these job instability or job insecurities, food insecurities, 
um, they won't be able to take care of themselves and seek those appointments, right? So how do we make sure that those are all taken care of while they are also being um, addressing some of the health needs and conditions that they have? A big part of it is also nutrition, right? And so we are also working towards um, having a nutritionist um, be a part of the care in our in our program in our in in the hospital. So that's a, an area that we also try to do with outreach is providing the our families information on how to eat better. It the, it, it may not look like the food group <laughs> plate that we learn in school because. We know culturally and ethnically, people have different ways of eating at home. And so we're we're doing our best to make sure it's culturally sensitive that, you know, what, it's not going to be um, a salad plate every night. <laughs> it's going to look like rice and beans or it's going to look like, you know, pork and chicken. But what does that mean? How do we season it? How do we make sure that they are we can adapt to um, the families that enjoy these kinds of meals that really, you know, you know, br brings home to them? So. Uh, there's a lot, there's a lot of work, I would say, that we put into the community health needs assessment. And it is a very big effort across the region from hospitals and uh, partner hospitals, our managed care plans and nonprofit community based organizations. Right. So um, going from that to your university partners, please talk about how your university partners helps elevate your platform and your efforts at the Lewis San Antonio Healthy Communities uh, Institute. Yes. Yeah. So one of our wonderful programs, which did launch initiate from our adolescent health programming is our non-clinical work non-clinical workforce development program, which is now, you know, is uh, being supported by our uh, population health coordinator, Syra. And so she has helped us really develop these affiliation agreements across all the different partner hospitals, such as Cal State San Bernardino, Cal, uh, Claremont Graduate University, KG. We have all <laughs> universities you can name probably that are interested in our program. But so essentially what we do is recruit uh, students from local colleges who are, have an interest in health service administration or public health, um, any health aspect, and we try to find a placement at, for them at the hospital. So they could be interning at the administration office, they could be interning with our uh, registered dietitian, they could be interning with the marketing, they intern with us at the schools. And so one of my favorite Part parts is really the interns that go into the schools because they are, again, they're provided this training from our staff and then they would be the ones that would instruct the students on our programs, which is Wellness Starts With You, Young Healthcare Academy. Um, and uh, and then they would uh, take those they take those um, information back as, and complete their hours if they have hours that they need to complete. So it's almost full circle when you think about workforce development. Not only have we gotten them to go into the schools to learn how to um, teach some of these school um, curriculum to the students, but they get the exposure in the hospital as well. So there's there's that nice blend of experience that I think when I was a public health student, I didn't get as a master's student um, going into a hospital or anything like that. But I think this is really what makes us very unique. Right. So Dr. Dingjun, talk about um, those workforce development gaps. Can you run down the list of those areas that are in greatest need? Yeah. I mean, we always need medical assistance. We always need the clinical lab scientists. We need phlebotomists. We need folks to really stay. And, and it's not that we want them to just stay in one um, uh, one area, but we want them to also grow within the field. And so there are opportunities for growth at for example at San Antonio we we talk about stackable credentials you can build those credentials whether you start off as a CNA which is a um, you know or, or you can get a, those certifications through Chapey College or uh, another community college and you can think about pivoting or getting additional certifications as well to support other areas in the hospital so in thinking about how do we advance clinical care? We want to also invest in the folks that are at the um, at the hospital already who are considering how to advance their careers, and and so that's the nice thing about the pipelining that we do drive because we have these new affiliation agreements. I think I'm very excited about the residency program as well, which is um, very new to the hospital with our partnership with Western University, and there's always a need for. Uh, um, for PAs, physicians, assistants, who will help alleviate some of the pressures that um, some of the physicians on our 
clinics in our clinics and in the hospitals that, that are that they get from um, the high needs in our patient care. Right. So you so went, we need more primary clinics, <laughs> in general okay. too. more primary yeah. clinics. Yes. Um, so you talked about clinical and non-clinical uh, career pathways. Uh, let's talk about what that retention looks like currently for the Lewis San Antonio Healthy Communities Institute in relation to, um, you know, turning that from an internship opportunity to an actual career or your foot in the door of healthcare. Yeah, so our our non-clinical, I, I would say that's one of the areas that uh, I can that we've had staff that have been previous interns who became full-time employees. So that's the nice thing about um, t- the trajectory and what we've been able to offer to some of our interns that have worked with us. And we have been following them. We are looking to see where they're going. And the nice thing is also that some of them have landed jobs at the county working in the public health department. Some are at UCR. Some of them are all over the different areas in our community. So um, that's the the goal really is that we want to train folks here and then keep them here. Right. And for the clinical aspects of it, I mean, I can only speak very <laughs> little about it, but because it's it's not really something that we oversee at the Lewis San Antonio Healthy Communities Institute, but in collaboration with our medical education and the clinical sh- shadowing program, the goal is really to help um those that are very intrigued and interested in healthcare um, navigate through what that pro- next step process is and getting those um, on site training from uh, healthcare professionals on the ground. So we'll, they'll get some of that mentorship and hopefully that will help facilitate the next steps for our high school students and the kind of majors that they want to get into. Please talk about other uh, less known benefits to participating in the HCI program at San Antonio Lewis Healthy Community. Yeah, again, we are, we, a lot of folks have reached out to us now that they've learned that we exist. And so that's the, I think we've been kind of the best kept secret for a while. But the nice thing is that we are hoping to reach out into communities that don't have any of these kinds of programs available. Although we do work with currently, for example, the ROP programs or with, um, programs that have healthcare career pathways, we do want to get into schools that don't have any of these opportunities so we can help bridge some of those understanding. And um, even we want to engage with parents. So I think that's the one side uh, as well that we haven't really talked a lot about is that I think when we onboarded the uh, students for clinical shadowing, the parents were just as interested as the students. And so um, I think that's one of the primary areas that has gained a lot of traction in more more recent years is the clinical shadowing program and it's an experience that um, although if the students don't get in they can also volunteer at the hospital and that's very important too Um, they will get badged they will get to um, help with our um, our programs that we have available through our volunteer services as well so I understand you're going to have a new cohort cohort of internship opportunities with a deadline please talk about that where they need to go, you know, where applicants, students can go to apply, submit um, their interest, their application, and when the deadline is. Yes. So, so although we have our, our San Antonio clinical shadowing program, the expanded version will be in June. So the last two weeks of June or last few weeks of June will have the countywide version of the clinical shadowing program and placing them throughout the county with partner hospitals. And so for anyone that's really interested in this program, we do have, um, you might have to email us to get the information or find us on our website at SAR.org. And we'll be able to provide you with the application link where you you can have students apply. And these are only for juniors in high school. So I just want to remind everyone, these are specifically for juniors in high school. Uh, Possibly some are considering seniors and, uh, and a part Part of it is because depending on the age of the students from minors to adults, we want to make sure that they are able to come into the program seamlessly. And so, yes, that's how we will be uh, launching the expanded version of our program for clinical shadowing. It will be in June and we'll have a big celebration at the conclusion of the program for uh, around probably July or August. So that's really to engage everyone that's been involved from supervising the program in the units, in the departments, to the parents, to the students, and to the county that have been so generous to giving us the opportunity to help expand this effort. 
Right. So that's uh, everybody go visit sarh.org. We will share a link um, on the YouTube video so you can just click on it, go directly to the Lewis San Antonio Healthy Communities Institute and learn more about those deadlines and download the application so that you don't miss the deadline. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so let's talk about um, areas beyond San Bernardino County to participate. Is, is it beyond San Bernardino or are you currently local to San Bernardino um, as it stands? Yeah, we're getting a lot of interest from other counties um, like L.A. County because Pomona is so close to Upland, too. But currently right now, uh, because we are receiving funding support from San Bernardino County, the expanded version will be only limited to San, Ber San Bernardino County students. Uh, but the goal is really that we want to um, share these models and we have a toolkit that's been developed that we can share with other hospitals on how do you get started? How do, what do we need to make sure is put in place uh, legally to ensure that they all the students have a really good experience? What is it going to take? Because we know hospital care team members are very busy as it is. And so we want to be mindful. But a lot of them do want to educate and mentor our students as well. Because I always think about, you know, these are the ones, these are the future of our right. health care. And so who's going to be taking care of us, right? And, and we got to make sure that they're equipped and trained um, as much as possible. And so we can't do it alone. We have to, we try to partner and be collaborative as much as we can. So um, please talk about what some of your future goals are um, at the Lewis San Antonio Healthy Communities Institute and what you're most inspired by as you look into the future. Yeah, so I'm I'm just really inspired by my team. You know, I we have I look at our entire population health team and they have been the glue. They have been really the the driving force in our community and they're I think a lot of it really is the enthusiasm and excitement they bring to the program that enhances already the more exciting curriculum that we provide and offer in our community. And so I think I, I love to lead, have them lead it organically. I think they have such a great talent um, from their experiences in education and public health, being local residents. And so they have a good idea of, you know, what wave will we head towards? And one of the biggest part really is like, how can we be more collaborative? There's so many collaboratives in the community. I do hope that everyone continues to be engage in those conversations and that's really my vision is that we we have to have these conversations um that are that are happening around the community with our thought leaders but at the same time we have to put action to those words right we want to figure out like who are the our best partners and with our health equity diversity and inclusion council we have a community advisory committee where we have we invite communities to be in, involved with some of the discussions with us so that way we can help bridge some of those gaps, whether it's addressing homelessness or addressing school um, resources and supplementing some of that with our curriculum. There's so much we can offer. It's just really what are the needs, the current urgent needs that we need to address at the moment. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your expertise, Dr. Jingjin, and thank you for your tremendous work and you know, groundbreaking uh, models to expand. Uh, now the problem, quote unquote problem, is a great problem to have is the desire to make it grow and scale it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's very important. Thank you. So thank you so much. All right, everybody listening, dive into a world of relaxation and practice low impact exercises that increase health, flexibility, circulation, balance, and well-being with Tai Chi classes and new sessions beginning on April 1st, taking place Mondays, Wednesdays, Wednesdays and Fridays from 10.30 a.m. to 12 p.m. at the Jesse Turner Center, located at 15556 Summit Avenue in Fontana, California. For more information, call 909-349-6900 or visit recreation.fontanacalifornia.gov. Don't miss the Empire Strikers match on Sunday, March 31st, with a Fan Appreciation Day against Tacoma with a kickoff at 4.05 p.m. Call 909-457-0252 or visit empirestrikers.com for more information and defend the Empire. Don't forget to find us on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Again, check us out on scbrtalk.com. Don't miss my interview with Bel Hernandez Castillo, an entrepreneur, award-winning journalist, and producer. She is the co-founder and CEO of Latin Heat, the first entertainment trade publication focused on the coverage of Latinos in Hollywood. Movie Maker Magazine dubbed her the godmother of Latino Hollywood and now heads Latin Heat Media, a multimedia company that includes an entertainment site, a production arm, 
that includes the Telly Award winning TV show, The Trend Talk, and several films and stage productions, and Latina Fest, which is coming up. Mind, Body, and Soul, the largest outdoor festival on the West Coast celebrating Latinas. Next week, we will have San Bernardino County District Attorney Jason Anderson. Mr. Anderson has been a member of the California State Bar since 1997. He graduated from Regent University School of Law in Virginia in 1996. Mr. Anderson served as a Deputy District Attorney for the County of San Bernardino from 1998 until 2014. In this capacity, he worked as a prosecutor handling a variety of serious cases, particularly particularly in the Crimes Against Children's Unit for 13 years. Mr. Anderson has been married for 26 years and has two beautiful children. District Attorney Anderson's mission includes respecting and inspiring confidence in the rule of law, both inside and outside the office. You do not want to miss it. We will see you all next week. Mm -hmm.